Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. We love you. We are so glad you've chosen to join with us today. Uh, Cam and the team are getting ready to lead us in worship through music. I will be back after that to bring the word, our final message in the series, Where Do We Go From Here? I hope you're ready. Hope you're excited. Church starts now. give life, you are love, you shine light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, great are you your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you Lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great
my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone Transfixed on Jesus' face And oh, praise the name of the Lord our God Oh, praise His name Nothing less 
than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. I stand alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. He stood alone, cornerstone. Good day, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're staying connected. Hope you're ready to hear what God is speaking to us today. This is the final week of our series entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? And just as a quick recap, week one, Pastor Tom talked about the principle of the path because direction determines destination. Now, on week two, I spoke about the concept of thinking small to reach big, the need for innovation and creativity as the church moves forward uh, in these unprecedented times that we find ourselves in. And then last week, uh, Tom talked about the fact that church isn't canceled because church isn't an event, church is people. Therefore, we have been deployed. The church is a force. We are out of the building and into the marketplace. Well, you know, you may ask yourself, well, what's the purpose of all this. Well, the heart behind this series is really to cast vision for the future and to start answering the questions that we need to be asking. Where do we as a church go from here? What are our next steps? What future is God leading us into? Life as we know it has completely shifted this year. And we as a church, as believers, as disciples of Jesus, We need to know what it means and how it looks to walk out our faith at this moment in time. Today, I've been tasked with bringing this series to a close. And in doing so, I feel that we need to revisit certain truths that are foundational to our understanding, our philosophy of church. But first, let me tell you a story to get us into where we're going today. Now, as many of you know, my family absolutely loves Disneyland. Uh, Really, any Disney park for that matter. Love may be too uh, weak of a word to use in describing our affection towards that place. We've been uh, many, many 
many, many, many times. Uh, We enjoy every moment. We love sharing the experience with others. We are constantly planning our next trip. Even when we are not allowed to travel, we are still planning our next trip. We, I guess, are just uh, suckers for punishment that way. Uh, Since we've gone, uh, you know, we've taken young kids, we've taken big groups, we've taken teenagers, mission teams, a variety of uh, groups and individuals. One thing that we've learned is that you've got to have a plan for what to do if the group gets separated or if someone gets lost. Uh, it's a busy place. In case you didn't know that, it's, it's a quite a busy and bustling and fast-paced uh, place to be at. There's a good chance of this happening. Especially, you know, you've all come off of a ride or an attraction. You want to head on to the next thing, the next ride, the next land. You know, maybe someone uh, isn't really listening or doesn't exactly know where we're headed next. The possibility as the group starts to move on to the next thing for someone to get left behind or turned around is pretty great. And suddenly, when that happens, the happiest place on earth isn't so happy anymore. So we've always said, if you get separated from the group, if you get left behind or lost, just head back to the last place we were all together and wait there. Because sure enough, sooner or later, we will figure out we're missing someone and we can easily send someone back to the last place we were all gathered and find you waiting there for us. Now, this plan served us very well as a family a few years back when, due to a terrible miscommunication, miscommunication, Lexi, our youngest daughter, was left behind. Uh, Our group had just been finishing up Adventureland. We just came off of the Indiana Jones ride. It was time to head on to a a new land and and new adventures. Uh, I thought that Erica had Lexi. Erica thought that I had Lexi. So we both headed in our different directions. I was heading towards the bathroom. Erica's heading towards some stores to do some shopping. Neither of us had Lexi. And she was left behind, left to wander through Adventureland by herself. Now, thankfully, it was, you know, less than five minutes later that we realized, hold on a second, we are definitely one child short of our pack. And we sprinted back to where we had just come from, hoping that our youngest could remember the simple idea to return to where you had last seen everyone together. Now, we found her strolling through Adventureland hand-in-hand hand with a cast member, telling this person all about everything that was going on, how mommy and daddy were lost, but if we could just go back to where she had last seen us, they would be there waiting for her. The plan worked. Even at her young age, she understood the simple concept to not forget where we had last been and to head back there, and mommy and daddy would be there waiting for her. Now, here's the big idea for today. As we ask this important question, where do we go from here? In moments where we need to pivot and change direction and head onto something new, there's a greater possibility for separation or of losing something important in the process. So in these moments, when we ask these pivotal questions, it is absolutely crucial to remember where we've been. Don't forget, don't lose sight of where we've come from. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made two statements which are foundational to our call both as believers and as a church. Pastor Tom referenced both of these in his message last week, and today we're going to press in a little deeper. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. In Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13, Jesus says this. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Salt and light. Two metaphors that have always directed what it means to be the church. But because of all that has shifted this year, I believe that we once again need to look at what it means to be salt and to be light at this moment in time. We can't lose sight of these essential pieces of our call, and we can't leave them behind as we move on to where we go next. Let's pray. God, thank you that you have a word to speak to us, to our church this morning. God, pray that right now, before we go any further, that you would open hearts that you would open minds to hear clearly what you are speaking. That God, though it may be challenging, though it may uh, 
be tough to hear at times. God, I pray that you, with your loving voice, would be the one that is heard as you lead us and guide us through our new reality into all that you have in store for us. God, would you speak to us today in Jesus' name? Amen. Eric and I, we love to watch shows about food. Whether it's, it's how to cook, whether it's competitive cooking shows, whether it's shows that combine food and travel, whether it's just the best thing I ever ate. If it's about food, we are all over it. And one of the things that we always comment on is the incredibly liberal use of salt that is applied when a chef says, and then just a little bit of salt to bring out the flavor. Maybe little has a different meaning in the culinary world, or, or maybe these chefs just know what they're talking about. You see, salt enhances the taste of food. It opens up our taste buds. It, it brings out the natural flavors of the other foods it is combined with. You notice when there's too little salt in a dish because the dish ends up being bland and lacking. And you notice when there's too much of it because it can overpower the dish and leave a bad taste in your mouth. But when the chef gets it right, when he applies the correct amount of salt, the dish is tied together perfectly and your taste buds rejoice as they are treated to something absolutely incredible. Now I suggest that the same is true of the church as we are called to be the salt of the earth. Too little presence, too little influence, too little voice, and we end up bland. Nothing of interest to see here. We've made no difference. We've made no impact. Too much presence, too much influence, too much voice, and we become overpowering. We leave a bad taste in people's mouths. Maybe we were just overeager, or maybe we forgot to think before we speak. Whatever the case, in our attempt to be salt, we overdid it, and we ended up turning off the very people we are called to attract. But when we get it right, when we hit the sweet spot of presence and influence and voice, when we know when best to press in and when to hold back, when we are mindful of how we show up and how we represent the one for who we are ambassadors, something incredible happens. The church makes a difference. We have impact in our world and the culture around us. Unfortunately, all too often, I believe the church either underdoes it or overdoes it when it comes to being salt. We tend to have a hard time getting this one right. So what does it mean to be the salt of the earth, and how do we walk this out within our present context? Well, let's break this down. Number one, salt preserves. Just as actual salt is used to keep food from spoiling or from going bad, the church is called to be a preserving agent within the world that we live. The church preserves and reinforces the qualities of goodness, honor, justice, and mercy in a society. Preservation isn't about forcing the world to follow a Christian agenda. It's about being living examples of his nature, being living examples of his goodness, his mercy, his justice, and then calling others around us to do the same, thereby keeping these qualities present in our world. Earlier this year, I covered the concepts of justice and mercy, and Pastor Lottie covered the idea of goodness and kindness during our Is God series. And I encourage you to go back and check out those messages again for more uh, in-depth discussion about how to live out these key qualities in our culture at this moment in time. Here's what I will say, though. Our world has gotten ugly this year. Blatant injustices Division over everything from politics to pandemics, complete lack of kindness and grace towards our fellow man, fear-mongering and snap judgments. It's not a good look outside of our windows. I mean, just yesterday it was reported that, that Dr. Bonnie Henry, the one who has been charged with keeping us safe here in BC, has been on the receiving end of abusive phone calls, online harassment, and even death threats. I mean, come on, people. That's just ridiculous. It's time for goodness and mercy, and justice to permeate our culture. And it starts with the church. We preserve these qualities in our world when we reflect the nature of our God and live them out day by day by day. Second is this. Salt gives zest and flavor. 
Now, I've already mentioned the importance of getting this right, not too much and not too little. You see, we are called to add something distinctive and tasteful to our environment. We bring something to the party every time we show up. So what will it be? Joy? Peace? Hope? Love? Life? Wisdom? Too often, I fear, when Christians show up, all we bring is a bad flavor. Judgment, gossip, political or or personal agendas, negativity. We need to get this right. Church, we have to do better. We can't afford to be leaving a bad taste in the mouth of every person we come across. We need to ask ourselves, what is the flavor that I am bringing, that I am adding when I show up? Is it a good flavor or is it a bad flavor? And finally, the church must maintain its saltiness. I mean, perhaps most important of all is this concept that we must not lose our saltiness. See again what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now this warning is found at different times in Matthew, in Mark, and in Luke. Jesus seemingly repeated this teaching about salt and subsequent warning to not lose its nature throughout his ministry, meaning we need to take note of this very carefully. In reading about the methods of gathering salt at the time when Jesus lived, which is riveting reading, let me tell you, it appears that the salt used at that time was often impure, as it was mixed or mingled with vegetation or other earthly substances. Once once it lost its flavor, it was of absolutely no value or use because all that remained was just earthy matter. Good for nothing other than to spread on paths or walkways as we would do with gravel nowadays. In extreme cases, the impurities would actually cause the tasteless salt to destroy all fertility wherever it was tossed. In other words, salt that has lost its saltiness is useless at best and destructive at worst. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a useless church, and I don't want to be a destructive church. Taking it one step further, salt that has lost its taste or ability to preserve is actually just irrelevant. The church must find ways to remain relevant. And let me tell you, This won't be done by jumping on the latest fad or catering to the loudest audience. Relevance speaks of being current and pertinent. Relevance has something to say that matters in the here and now. Well, guess what? Hope is always relevant. Love is always relevant. Purpose is always relevant. Jesus is always relevant. If the church can stay on message... The salt won't be losing its saltiness anytime soon. Basically, less acting salty about everything and more being the preserving and flavorful salt of the earth that we have been called to be. Now, show of hands, who was afraid of the dark when they were a child? I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that the majority of people watching probably have a hand raised. Fear of the dark is a very, very common childhood fear. Right now in our home, Lexi is the child that is scared of the dark. And, and I use scared with the quotation marks because I'll be honest, it usually only becomes an issue when it involves her doing a chore or being asked to do something that she doesn't want to do. It's a selective fear. Valid or not though, here's what I've observed. Her fear of the dark is rooted in a worry that she won't be able to find the light switch in the area that she's going to. So she rarely ever refuses to do what's being asked. Rather, she counters with the offer for someone else to go with her. Someone that can go with ahead of her, turn on the light switch, and then stay with her when she's down there, and then turn it off when she leaves. So she never has to enter the dark or exit the dark on her own. Now, I was thinking about this, and it occurred to me, isn't this really just a very simplified picture of what it means to be the church? We let people know that we know where the light is. We become willing to walk alongside them as they try to navigate life in darkness. 
We show them where the light is and how to turn it on. And then we stay with them once it's on because really it's about a whole lot more than just flipping a switch. Something to think about as we head into the second part of today's text. I want to reread Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 and 16, where Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You are the light of the world. I want to give a, a point of clarity and a word of caution so that we don't misinterpret this statement. John chapter 8, verse 12 Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light of the world. We are called to bear witness to his light, to reflect his light, to carry his light into the world, to shine his light. So by extension, we, the church and individual believers, we are the light of the world because we have been commissioned to be Jesus in our world. But let's not make any mistake. We are not the light. We are not Jesus. We need to be careful to not buy our own hype or manufacture our own light. We need to stay on message. If you find that you are taking it upon yourself to illuminate the darkness in our world, rather than creating a space for his light to illuminate, you may want to check your motive. The moon shines in the night sky because its surface reflects the light generated by the sun. In the same way, we are called to reflect the light of the Son, Jesus Christ. As we grow in our relationship with him, as we become more spiritually mature, the strength of his reflection should become brighter and brighter as our lives start to look more and more like Jesus. And the importance of this is twofold. The first is this. When the moon shines in the night sky, the sun isn't gone. It's just that where I'm standing on this planet is now opposite of where the sun is shining because of the rotation of the earth. The sun hasn't moved, but my position has shifted such that my view of the sun is blocked. For some people, their current position has caused their view of the sun to be blocked. Something has come in between them and Jesus, but perhaps they can see you. You then are his reflection in their world. Second is this, reflect the right light. I've already covered the don't manufacture your own light caution. Don't try to be the light when Jesus is the light. Here's a few more. We aren't called to reflect our favorite preacher or Christian celebrity. We aren't called to reflect the traditions or culture of Christianity. We aren't called to reflect our super spiritual friend's faith. We are called to reflect Jesus, his light, his love, his life, which means that we need to be spending more time looking at him than we are looking at the things that we are not called to reflect. And we need to be sure when we reflect his light to shine as bright as we possibly can. Like the word says, no one lights a lamp and hides it under a basket. It's of no use. They put it on a stand. They put it in a place of prominence so that it can fill the entire house, the entire space with light. Don't be ashamed of his light shining through your life. It illuminates your good works and your words of witness, which in turn glorify God and direct people's attention towards him. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Proclaim Jesus. Proclaim the light of the world. Shine his light as bright as you can. So in closing, Let's go back to that initial question that has been hovering over these last few weeks. Where do we go from here? Well, wherever it might be, regardless of what is still to come this year, no matter what direction God sets for us, let us not lose sight of what we are called to be in the first place, salt and light. In my previous message a couple weeks back when I talked about thinking small to reach big, I I mentioned the unfortunate reality 
but many churches may end up closing their doors this year due to the complications and challenges created by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And I, I feel very strongly that we are at a pivotal moment in time right now, that how the church chooses to respond, how the church chooses to move forward right now is going to have significant impact and effect on our relevance and our ability to endure. I'm concerned that some churches will find ways to innovate and find new ways of doing church, but in the process, they will lose their saltiness or their lights will dim. I'm concerned that other churches may decide that now is a time to amp everything up, just pour more salt and put those lights on as bright as they possibly can. Nothing can stop us. And in doing so, potentially create an environment that is no longer attractive to anyone. Church, this is our foundational call. We have to get this right. When you're at the grocery store, when you're stuck in traffic, when you're at home or at school or at work, when you're out and about in the community, when you're spending time with close friends, in every space you inhabit, in every situation you find yourself in, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Something should change for the better when you show up. Something good should be added to the space when you walk into it. Your words and your actions should bring glory and honor to his name. And Jesus should be present and evident in every place you walk into. We are called to make a difference. The church is meant to have an impact. But it won't happen if we don't understand or mishandle these foundational calls to be salt and to be light in our world. So church, will you join me in accepting this responsibility and working together to make sure that we get this right and be the salt of the earth and be the light in the world and make a difference in the name of Jesus? Let's pray. God, your words today are so inspiring to me and so in cha- and so challenging at the same time. And God, I pray for everyone watching and listening the same, that we would be inspired by your call for us to be salt and light, but we would also not miss the responsibility that comes with that and the challenge that we must pick up. God, I pray that in being salt, that we would not be too little or be too much. God, I pray that you would help us to find the exact right amount that we need to be so that when we show up, that we are adding flavor, that we are tasteful, that we are preserving what needs to be preserved. God, I pray that we would not be bland Christians. We would not be bland as a church. God, I pray that we would not be the type of church or believers that just overdoes the salt and leaves a bad taste in everyone's mouth. God, I pray that you would help us to get this right. God, for our light, I pray that our light would not be so dim that no one sees you. And I pray it would not be so bright that it blinds everyone. God, I pray that when people look to us, and look to our church, God, that we would be an accurate and a true reflection of who you are. That they would see us and really they just see your light shining through us. God, I I, I am burdened by this um, responsibility. It's, it's a weighty thing on my shoulders, God, that we need to get this right, that we are living at a key moment in time. And God, I believe that you have direction for our church. I believe that you have a plan for our church. I believe that you are walking us into an amazing future. But God, I pray that as we follow you, we would not leave these things behind or misuse them or lose sight of them. But God, that we would know exactly what it means to be the salt and the light in this world. I ask this and I pray this in Jesus' name. And I also want to just take a minute, if you're watching today, if you're listening today, and you've never made a decision for Jesus Christ, today is your moment. Today is your chance to answer that question in your life. So if you're at home, if you're with friends, if you're on transit somewhere or out and about watching on your mobile device, if you just feel God speaking to you right now, if you just feel Jesus um, present with you and you know that now is the time to make a decision to say, God, I need you. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me with your grace and mercy. Uh, fill me with your love and your peace. God, if that's you, I just ask that you just pray this prayer along with me and I want to celebrate with you today. So God, for anyone who's making this choice, pray this along with me. God, I recognize that I am a sinner. God, I recognize that your son, Jesus, died in my place, 
that he has grace and mercy and love and abundance for me. And today, in this moment, I'm asking him to come into my life. I'm asking for that love and mercy and grace to get flood into my life. God, I ask that you would forgive me of all my sins. I ask that you would show me how best to walk in your ways. And God, I pray that right now, in this moment, I would feel your presence. I would feel you close to me. And I would know that I am a dearly loved child of yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if that was you, if you made that choice, if you prayed that prayer today, we want to celebrate with you. Make sure you tell someone. If you're with someone, tell them. If you're on your own, message us. Send a message to our church, to our staff. You can find that information on our website or Facebook group. We want to celebrate along with you this incredible decision that you made today to have Jesus become and be a part of your life. So church, this is we're done for today. We got more and more coming up in the weeks to come. Stay tuned for all of our upcoming announcements. Next week, we have some exciting news about what we have planned for Thanksgiving Sunday. Be sure to tune in, tune in for that. We hope you guys have a wonderful day. God bless.